this one. This is, you teach a course on death. Yeah. Good evening or afternoon, lovely afternoon. Welcome. First, I want to remind everyone uh, just to maintain the loveliness of our opening audiology. If you could turn off your cell phones, that would be a great way to begin this ritual event. My name is Catherine Lofton, and I teach uh, in the history of religions here at Yale University. I want to welcome you to this, the third lecture in a four lecture series of this year's Dwight H. Terry Lectureship. This year's Terry Lectures are being given by Philip Kitcher, currently teaching at Columbia University in their Department of Philosophy, where he holds an appointment as the John Dewey Professor of Philosophy, an auspicious title which, in the opening lecture, Dale Martin pointed out that Dewey himself was the first person to give the lectures in this series. Since Professor Kitcher has already been introduced twice in this series with preambles that beautifully emphasized his enormous list of accomplishments, academic appointments, notable awards, significant editorial stewardships, and intellectual contributions, I'm going to defer for now those proper noun laden remarks, trust that all of you possess Google in your disposal, and can quickly stand in the very true awe at the totems of Professor Kitcher's remarkable career of institutional <laughs> service and philosophical significance. Instead, I want to offer a very brief homage to the kind of intellectual that Professor Kitcher is. I first encountered Professor Kitcher in the, it may seem strange, I'm a scholar of American religious history, why do I stand here today? And the reason is that I revealed to Professor Dale Martin the following strange biographical fact that in the late 1990s, I, as then a late adolescent, was a typical, I think of perhaps people in this room, a late adolescent nerd gobbling up very popular nerd publications like the London Review of Books. I would receive the LRB and the NYRB in bundles from a family for which I was an occasional au pair. And I would sit for very long heathen Sundays, gorging on their contents. During the same time period, Hitcher had an occasional appearance in the LRB, offering diagnosis on a subject that was at the time very close to my late adolescent heart, the question of evolution, biology, and concepts of the self. In those essays, Kitcher, already an established academic philosopher, although I hardly knew that at the time, spoke to the absolute nub of every problem he found, quickly cutting away the illogic of this or that scientific shibboleth with a knowledge that seemed to my young eye as the very definition of the total intellectual. He was wry, sure, and he had a kind of rhetorical panache. But more importantly to me, he seemed so clear-eyed before the grandiose world and its confusion of obnoxious interpretations. A review of Kitcher's writing, which this occasion has offered me the opportunity to peruse, shows that time and again, he walks into material, into knotty thickets, and carefully straightens out their cords, chatting amiably to you, the reader, above this nonsense as he does so. You begin any Kitcher book or article feeling very sure about the meanings of words in their worlds, scientific, ethical, literary, but by the end you feel certain that you are also quite formally confused and now have been righted by somebody who carries every tool in his toolbox. There may be and are, I think, many words for this kind of graceful thinker, but for the purposes of our contemporary humanist moment, I want to celebrate Philip Kitcher, and most particularly as an interdisciplinary artist, as somebody for whom the questions of our time simply cannot be conceived merely through transom windows. We need kaleidoscope eyes to parry with the problems of self, body, science, history, philanthropy, and community. Our disciplines discipline us, absolutely, but like all martial disciplines, they cannot be useful if we can only follow their paces in regulated forms at the beginning of classes. At the same time that I was discovering Kitcher in the LRB, a group of Frenchmen calling themselves the Yamakasi Group developed parkour, 
a kind of street gymnastics in which highly trained individuals move quickly through urban environments using complex material facts of the city as their leverage and inspiration. YouTube that later, parkour. Today, we will hear Professor Kitcher's third lecture in the Terry series titled, Mortality and Meaning. And we will get to watch what I think of as parkour and rhetorical form as Professor Kitcher uses concepts from the world to make sense of it with incomparable agility and careful grace. Please help me welcome Professor Kitcher again to Yale University. Thank you, that was really lovely. We'll talk over dinner. <laughs> Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. So, in 1868, two years after he'd finished the six movements originally planned for his German Requiem, Brahms inserted a seventh, a soprano solo, punctuated by muted interjections from the chorus. You just heard that, uh, at least in the background. The text he chose promises consolation. Those who grieve will be comforted. The bereaved will again see those they have lost. Brahms' setting responds to the mourner's sorrow with gestures of exquisite tenderness. Music-loving secularists, however resolute their non-belief, should concede its emotional power. Culturally successful religions are often credited with enabling their followers to understand and to accept the major transitions in human life. They've had plenty of practice, typically centuries or millennia in which they've shaped their rites. Those like Christianity and Islam that promise an eternal continuation to which mundane human life is a prelude seem specially adept at coping with the last transition. Death is supposedly easier for the devout to bear. Part of the relief comes from prospects of personal continuation and hopes for reunion with others who have been loved and lost. Consolation also flows from faith in a link between human individuals and the transcendent, a connection that confers upon each human life an eternal significance. For the non-believer, however, there's no hope of future survival or of reclaiming the dead. Individual human lives are thoroughly finite their effects evanescent. All human life will eventually cease. Human finitude leaves nothing to celebrate in the wake of a human life. What use is Darwin at a funeral? Mortality and meaning raise connected challenges to secular humanism. I'm going to try to show that many of the difficulties are more apparent than real. How should a secular humanist think about the prospect of his own death? A classic recommendation sees fear as inappropriate. With death will come the end of pain, of suffering, of frustrated striving. Hamlet, meditating suicide, calls death a consummation devoutly to be wished, until, turning suddenly devout, he imagines an afterlife in which the torments of mundane existence continue. Secularists who dismiss that possibility can avoid Hamlet's anxious retreat. Being dead is nothing to be frightened of. But there's the getting there. Fear can be directed not toward the state itself, but at the process of dying. People are often afraid not only of the pains that come at the end, but also of the unraveling of body and mind. So they're terrified at the thought of what they are likely to become, for seeing the surviving being as a grotesque parody of themselves. These concerns deserve support from those who might help them avoid, or at least mitigate, the conditions they fear. Support need not and probably should not come from religion, but from humane deployment of medical resources. Careful thoughts about the end should be expressed, developed in end-of-life conversations designed to allow death to approximate a person's reflective image of her life. Secular humanists regret that religious affiliations and indeed religious interventions all too often override people's anxieties about the inevitable ending. Yet maybe I've focused on the wrong emotion. As you look forward to the future, to a world without you, 
You might feel regret, not fear, being sad that you will no longer be a part of the show. The ancients offered reassurance. As you look back into the past, you contemplate with equanimity the long expanse of time before you were born. No pangs disturb you as you think about your absence from particular historical episodes. Why should you feel any differently about the future? Answer that supposedly rhetorical question with another question. Do you feel differently about your absence from different parts of the future? I do. As I imagine the world in the years immediately following my death, I'm far more regretful than when I contemplate the more distant future. Increasing the time interval diminishes my sadness. It fades asymptotically and relatively swiftly to indifference. Why is that? Not, I think, because of some quirk of my psychology, nor because I'm envious of those who live happily and actively into extreme old age. I don't even yearn for the longevity that advances in medicine might someday achieve for future generations. Absence from the period just after my death is poignant because so much of the stuff of my life will continue in it. Whenever I die, people about whom I care most will live on, and I should like to be there, sustaining them and being sustained by them. Endeavors to which I have committed my energies will remain unfinished. By contrast, the connections with the more distant future are dim, and I can't even be confident of the large contours of the remote world from which I'll be excluded. Were I to survive into that world, there would be a continuously evolving set of relationships and activities to give me a stake in it. But in the absence of any experience of that development of my life, the concerns I would come to have aren't vivid for me. So as I look forward sufficiently far, regret declines into indifference. The loss of the immediate future is hard for those whose lives attain or approach the biblically allotted span. But for the young who face the threat of imminent death, the sorrow is even more intense. No member of their unfortunate ranks has expressed the predicament more eloquently than Keats. When I have fears that I may cease to be before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high pilot books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, Regret and sadness become fear, but the fear isn't of death in general. That's nothing to be frightened of. Premature death, however, is fearsome, even terrifying, because it truncates and nullifies the pattern of a life. Although the later lines of the sonnet worry that he will never experience the love for which he yearns, Keats's first anxiety is for the expression of his genius. Central to his existence is his poetic vocation, if that vocation were realized only in a mutilated, abbreviated form, the meaning of his life would be lost. For secular humanism, the genuine problem of death is the problem of premature death. Deaths count as premature when they prevent lives from attaining meaning. The challenges of mortality and meaning connect. But you might think, aren't all deaths premature? Can any finite life be meaningful? A proposal. Human lives sometimes attain meaning through individuals developing conceptions of who they are and what matters to their existences, through their pursuit of the goals endorsed by those conceptions, and through some degree of success in attaining them. A Keats who lived for 80 years, piling up books full of poetry as extraordinary as the lyrics he wrote at the height of his powers, would have led a meaningful life whether or not he'd found love along the way. Indeed, the actual Keats, leaving only a fraction of what he might have written, lived a life whose meaning is untouched by his early death. Nor is exceptional achievement needed. Secularists should endorse not only the grand accomplishments of the poets and the statesmen and the scientists, but also the humbler self-conceptions of those whose pursuits and achievements focus more locally on family, on friendship, on community, on the maintenance of things that matter to a small group of other people. Mattering to others is what counts in conferring meaning. Keats matters to others because of a body of verse that continues to delight. The effects of more ordinary lives are felt on a smaller scale. 
but they can secure genuine work. The shape of the dispute between the secular humanist position and the religious perspective should now be visible. For the religious challenger, no set of characteristics of finite lives or of relations among finite lives can substitute for the connection to the transcendent that alone confers meaning and value. Problems about our own deaths lead, as I've tried to show, to deeper issues about the significance of finite lives. Yet the thought that we shall cease to be isn't the only way death figures as a problem for us. The loss of loved ones lacks secular compensation. In the beginning, the fabric of a human life is tightly woven. All the threads tying us together are fully intact. As people grow and others die, holes appear, leaving frayed ends that can't be reconnected. For those who live the longest, the final tapestry is a thing of shreds and tatters, its yawning vacancies recalling people whose laughter and whose touch is still longed for. Growing old beside someone you love brings the overwhelmingly likely prospect of an ending in which one will mourn the loss of the other. And the inevitable shrinking of the survivor's life is, for both parties, more fearsome than the anticipation of one's own bodily and mental decay. Back then to Brahms and the promise of reunion. Here apparently is a consolation secular humanism can't match, a hope religious widows and widowers sometimes confess they couldn't forfeit. Well-meaning people occasionally tender a similar hope to those who grieve for children who have died young, as Charles Kingsley did in a letter to his friend Thomas Henry Huxley. Huxley had lost his beloved first son, Noel, at the age of four, and Kingsley, the Reverend Charles Kingsley, regretted that the celebrated agnostic couldn't look forward to a reunion with the boy in heaven. Despite his grief, Huxley responded with an unflinching declaration of his resolve to serve truth. Imagine for a moment that King's vision of the hereafter was correct. Would his, would his promise of a future meeting have provided what his friend so desperately wanted? I don't think so. No such reunion would have extended the threads death had broken. Huxley's life had been interwoven with that of his child. He'd anticipated guiding the boy through his formative years, watching him mature into an adult, gradually fashioning a new, more equal relationship with Noel, looking on as the young man created his own pattern for his life. Parents who have lost their children, lovers who mourn the beloved, people who miss a close friend, want a continuation here and now. Not a meeting under very different, dimly imaginable conditions in which two strangers, their lives no longer connected, confront one another. The hole in life's fabric demands immediate repair. My religious challenger is likely to protest that the dismissal of the promised comfort rests on misunderstanding the character of the afterlife, on substituting a crude vision that undermines the real consolation. Yet mistaken as they may be about the glories of the hereafter, the bereaved are surely clear about the aching gap they feel in their lives. Whatever happens in the future, there's a loss in the mundane present. Moreover, purified religion, with its abstract, indescribable transcendent, cannot deliver much reassurance. For Kingsley's hope, or anything similar to respond in any fashion to the sorrows of the bereaved, it must rest on substantive religious doctrines. The words Brahms set must be heard as importing the everyday implications of Wiedersehen, to see again. Although Christians often express disdain for the material comforts of the paradise the Quran holds out to Muslims, the Islamic vision has the merit of connecting with the desires of the faithful. When religion retreats to confessing that the transcendent is a mystery, only apprehensible through figurative suggestions, its advertised power to bring comfort in the wake of death dissolves. Huxley was right to judge that the crumbs of comfort Kingsley offered depended on swallowing a fiction, on forsaking the devotion to truth. Purified religion does little better with respect to your own death. First, whatever the qualities of the envisaged continuation, 
present losses remain. Projects, some of them important, are left unfinished. If the compensation offered is a life in which suffering is behind you, in which there's an end to challenges and an end to struggle, the promise has a superficial appeal. But only until you reflect that individual identities are founded in commitments, in goals people struggle to realize. We may envisage a being psychologically continuous with ourselves, no longer invested in anything we have taken to be significant or central, but it's hard to regard that being as anyone we would want to become or to celebrate its existence as a splendid continuation of our own. Purified religion, with its restrained conception of the transcendent, can't even assume that the survivor will live in a condition of unimaginable bliss. In the end, the familiar thoughts that religion provides responses to problems posed by our mortality, responses greatly superior to anything secular humanism can offer, are distractions. The jibes about Darwin's uselessness at funerals grounded in misunderstanding the human situation. Death should usually be an occasion for sorrow, either on a religious or a secular account. If Brahms' soprano uplifts her hearers for a moment, that's because the music she sings is beautiful, and its sensitivity to the words reminds us vividly of things that are valuable within human life. The real challenge to secularism focuses on meaning and finitude. The problem is not whether secularists can match the religious response to death, but whether they can make adequate sense of life. The question of the good life is the oldest issue of Western philosophy one that drew the privileged young men of the ancient world to the various philosophical schools. Their mentors instructed them in techniques for living well, learn and practice virtue, be active in political life, cultivate friendships, pursue knowledge for its own sake, limit pleasures to those maintaining psychological equilibrium, and so forth. Contemporary judgment might expand the catalog and undo the distortions imposed by conceiving the good life as only possible for a privileged elite. After the fall of Rome, however, the old philosophical question lapsed in the intellectual culture of the West, for it seemed to have received a definitive solution. The Christian churches declared that the valuable life is one centered on obedience to God's commandments and rewarded by an eternal continuation. The finite span of earthly life is only a prelude it's worth determined by whether it fits us for eternity. The Enlightenment revived interest in the ancient problem. Secular thinkers endorsed the importance of many of the qualities highlighted in the classical tradition. Reacting to a prominent feature of the religious conception of the meaningful life, the outside imposition of meaning on the individual, some thinkers, Kant, Humboldt, and Mill, notable among them, emphasized the importance of autonomy, for a life to be meaningful, the person must have some conception of who she is and what aspirations are most important. And this conception must not be imposed from without. In Mill's classic formulation, the highest form of freedom is to pursue one's own good in one's own way. Each meaningful life is distinguished by a theme, a conception of the self and a concomitant identification of the goals it's most important to pursue. That theme should be autonomously chosen by the person whose life it is. But we shouldn't overinterpret the talk of themes and autonomous choice. Meaningful lives aren't restricted to the privileged few, to an elite of the high-minded. It's wrong to suppose that there has to be a transformative event, an epiphany around 16, say, when a condition of detached freedom permits the review of a large range of options and identification with exactly one of them in a commitment never to be amended or revoked. Someone's life theme may not be formulated explicitly unless or until a questioner inquires what matters most to her. Her autonomy may consist in the presence of different possibilities and in the absence of the everyday ways in which people are often coerced to assume the tasks and roles that form and dominate their lives. Moreover, the theme itself may evolve under the contingent conditions generated from previous pursuits. Originally centered on nurturing her children, 
A mother bears an infant who needs a particular kind of help. And through learning how to provide the necessary support, she comes to devote herself to assisting similar children. Are there further constraints on life themes beyond the requirement of autonomous choice? The Enlightenment thinkers believed there were, casting the classical emphasis on virtue as the demand that themes be ethically permissible. Mill limits his fundamental form of freedom. One person's choices and pursuits of his own good mustn't interfere with the kindred choices and pursuits of others. That constraint should be accepted, but it's too weak. Many projects posing no threat to the life patterns and the lives of others would be insignificant and worthless. Imagine, for example, an asocial solitary retreating to some remote place and passing his days in counting the blades of grass in his vicinity. Lives like that are wasted. So too, as I'll contend later, are others all too common in the affluent world in which people center their lives on the pursuit of material possessions, their self-conception summed up in a bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. Lives matter when they touch others. The impress of the ethical project should be felt more definitely in the individual's choice of self-conception. The problem of limited responsiveness was and remains the center of ethical practice, and individual lives gain meaning through their own contributions to solving that problem, through actions prompted by recognizing what other people want or need and attempting to provide the things required. Ethical values, I suggested last Thursday, are social creations worked out collectively to address a basic problem of the human situation. The meanings of lives are individual creations, products of people's autonomous choices, but framed always by the core ethical ideal of other directedness. Is there then no place for the meaningful life founded on the development of special talent, of genius that dedicates itself to self-expression? Indeed there is. For the demand for other directedness is met if talent and expressed genius are to be worthy of the names. Keats's fears of death is truncating the expression of his genius, already connected what he hoped to write with the lives of others. He foresaw high piled books as granaries to nourish his readers. If his writings had failed to move or illuminate others, or if he had resolved that his verse should be confined to his teeming brain, his choice of theme could not have conferred meaning on his brief life. Some lives are meaningful because their effects endure across many generations, perhaps in the form of words that continue to be read with profit or joy, perhaps in the guise of material objects or institutional structures enriching the lives of many people. The great touch the lives of millions or billions of people remote and unknown to them. As Diotima once told Socrates, they have the best kinds of children. Yet it's important to reject exceptionalism, the modern counterpart of ancient elitism. Ordinary lives attain meaning in the more local, but no less important differences they make. Ambitious young Stephen Dedalus avows his resolve to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Joyce reintroduces him once his attempt to soar has led him to share the fate of Icarus and sets the bruised Stephen beside a different protagonist, Mr. Leopold Bloom, advertising canvasser, whose ordinary life, for all its flaws, may yet attain worth and meaning. Religious people might concede that the features on which I focused mark differences among human lives, while denying that they can confer meaning. Autonomy only matters, they might think, when it expresses the free commitment to the transcendent, Contributing to the lives of others gains its significance from the objective standing of human beings as loci of value, bound to one another as children of a common parent. No link to the transcendent, no meaning. Fear of finitude runs through the writings of religious thinkers as sophisticated as William James and Paul Tillich. They regard the problem of finitude as dooming any non-religious perspective. Fear sometimes infects secular pessimists, too, for whom the bounded impact of any human existence entails the absurdity of life. 
Pessimism might be encapsulated in James's haunting image of our predicament as that of people living on a frozen lake surrounded by cliffs over which there is no escape, fully aware that the ice is slowly melting and the day on which they will vanish without trace is drawing ever closer. Religion is the answer to their, or to our, cry for help. But why should impermanence undermine meaning? I'll counter James's image with a different story. Toward the end of Thomas Mann's late masterpiece, Dr. Faustus, his focal character, the composer Adrian Leverkuhn, experiences in close proximity the deaths of his father and his father's surrogate, Max Schweigerstil. Leverkuhn has taken up residence on the Schweigerstil family farm a place with an uncanny resemblance to his childhood home in Buchel. And although his health would not permit him to make the long journey back to mourn his own father, he attends Schweigerstil's funeral. Returning from the ceremony, he is greeted by the distinctive smell of the old man's pipe. And now I'm going to quote from the novel. That endures, said Adrian, quite a while, perhaps as long as the house stands. It lingers on in Buchel too. The period of our lingering afterwards, perhaps a little shorter or a little longer, that is what is called immortality. The ordinary, unpretentious endurance of Max Schweigerstil is partly captured in the aroma, impregnated in the woodwork and the walls of the house in which he has passed his entire life. Eventually, of course, the odor will dissipate. The farm will be tended and maintained by people who know Schweigerstil only as a figure in faded photographs. The walls and fences he built will decay and be replaced. The fields he plowed and planted will be newly configured and put to different uses. For a while, though, he will be vivid in the memories of those who knew him, who were sustained by his labors and comforted by his presence. The fabric of their lives, initially left ragged by his death, will be rewoven in ways that preserve and cherish the recollections. His commitment to maintain and improve the farm his father left him and to pass it on to his own son will be felt in the early years after his death. So much, man invites us to think, suffices for a kind of immortality. I accept his invitation. This lingering is enough to confer meaning on an ordinary life. Would there be some qualitative difference if the impact of Schweigerstil's life were considerably extended, if his achievements were as long-lived as those of Keats, or even implausibly, if his agricultural accomplishments were recalled across the millennia as we celebrate the Homeric epics? Would the significance of his life be transformed if we imagined the earth and the human species and the farm and the memories of Max Schweigerstil to last forever? I don't think so. What matters is the fact that a life has a continuing connection to a world that endures beyond it. Like a stone cast into a pool, it leaves a series of ripples behind, sometimes more, sometimes less, and it doesn't matter that the ripples eventually fade away. Conceiving meaning and immortality in this way enables secular humanism to offer a more complete answer to the problems posed by death. Corresponding to the anguish of premature death is the consolation of the fulfilled life. The truly lucky are those who come to see that the projects singled out in their life themes have been largely finished. Not completely, of course, for there are always further endeavors, always loose ends. While they may take their current striving seriously and hope for the joys brought when those strivings succeed, reflection may convince them that they've done enough that if life ended now, it wouldn't subvert their most fundamental aspirations. A New Testament story captures the attitude. When the baby Jesus is brought to the temple to be circumcised, he is seen and held by the aged Simeon, prompting the declaration Anglican choirs sing as the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Simeon's reaction can be liberated from the divine project he takes to have been realized. It can be felt by anyone who recognizes that enough has been done to elaborate his life theme, that more is unnecessary, and that the returns from further efforts would diminish. 
Those left behind can't feel the same equanimity. How could they? They've lost a person whom they still long to see and touch and hear. Yet, provided they have time to renew and refashion their own life patterns, their awareness of the fulfilled life enables them to integrate the memories of the dead into their continuing relationships and endeavors. Eventually, other people will occupy the spaces originally left achingly blank. Nor will the new loves constitute a betrayal, for they'll be recognized as shaped by memories of those once mourned. The dead may be regarded with joyful gratitude, even with something akin to reverence. Perhaps the source of insistence on overcoming finitude is an argument. My life could only attain meaning from its effect on other lives if those other lives themselves were meaningful. So there begins a regress. The other lives would obtain their meaning from their impact on yet further lives whose meaningfulness would depend on their effects on yet more remote people and so on and on. But the sequence can't proceed indefinitely. Human life will eventually cease and all James's ice dwellers will be drowned. There must be some last member of the chain. Since this person can have no impact on some subsequent meaningful life, her life is deprived of meaning. Lack of meaning now seeps backward through the entire sequence. Because those in the n plus first place don't enjoy meaningful lives, the people at the nth stage don't have effects on meaningful lives, and hence their lives are devoid of meaning. But to state the argument explicitly makes it evident how to resist it. The picture of something acquiring meaning through relationship to something else that already has meaning is doomed from the start, especially if the somethings are qualitatively equivalent. But meaning lies in the relationship itself. One life may be meaningful through its effects on others, effects that contribute to the possibility of the lives affected developing meaningfully, even though contingent factors subvert that development. Schweigerstil's life would remain meaningful, even if the fortunes of family and farm gradually declined across the subsequent generations, even if the property were eventually sold and the descendants scattered in a very different society. Nothing endures forever, but lives centered on extending the existence of something people treasure are not automatically deprived of meaning by the fact of impermanence. Purified religion sets against this image of meaningful lives with local, short-lived effects an ostensibly grander perspective. Independent of human aspirations, there's some eternal goal, and the meaning of individual lives stems from their acquiescence in the goal and the necessarily infinitesimal contributions people make to it. Transcending finitude is purchased at the cost of autonomy, Mill's fundamental freedom, the choice of one's own good, is subordinated to a cosmic enterprise beyond human understanding. Our autonomy is reduced to acceptance of a remote venture in which we play bit parts without knowing how our doings contribute. How our condition of alienated labor confers meaning on what we do is a mystery. Worse, the ordinary things that matter to people, the stuff of meaningful lives, don't receive their value from any human concerns. Relations to the lives of others are not significant because extending and expanding responsiveness is at the heart of the ethical project. Rather, acts of caring, nurturing, sustaining, and protecting achieve their special status from the terms of the cosmic enterprise. The yearning to transcend human finitude ends by restricting autonomy and estranging what is most centrally human. Meaningful lives do require a connection to something larger, but not to anything eternal or cosmic. Humanism affirms both the potential meaningfulness of our deeds and the finite character of their impact, endorsing the local immortality recalled by man's protagonist. Humanism, I think, can only be secular. Once they're clearly in view, the intellectual problems posed for secular humanism by mortality and meaning can be resolved. But practical difficulties remain. Many, surely most, human lives don't go well. Among the contemporary global population, millions if not billions struggle to gather the necessities that enable them and their children to continue from day to day. 
For many more, secularist praise of autonomous choice of one's own good would be a tasteless joke. Statistics indicate that religious adherence and religious fervor flourish among the people most vulnerable to life's vicissitudes. That shouldn't be surprising. Religious doctrine and religious community can provide hope that the reversals of the present fragile existence will somehow be compensated. They can also give opportunities for mutual support and consolation. Even if the promises of future rewards are hollow, the benefits brought by religious community may be real. Because substantive religious doctrines often retain the prejudices inscribed by the supposed ethical authorities of the tradition, for example, in their views of the roles appropriate for women, they can intensify the confinement of autonomy and erect further barriers to living a meaningful life. Nevertheless, religious communities have often brought the powerless together, identifying shared sources of oppression and combining voices so that they could at last be heard. Famously, the civil rights movement of the 1960s was grounded in the churches, led by eloquent preachers who could galvanize their congregations. Less evident to many is the social role religious communities continue to provide, the resources they offer to families struggling to create better opportunities for their children in environments where secular institutions are woefully inadequate. It doesn't have to be that way. Secular society might respond to the problems of economic and social justice, honoring the egalitarian ideal of the provision for all of the preconditions for a meaningful life. Even the most striking attempts to nurture all nascent lives undertaken in Scandinavian societies have fallen short of that ideal. The lapses of other affluent societies in Northern Europe or in Japan, in Canada, Australia, Britain, and the United States are successively more glaring, signifying at the latter end of the continuum a willingness to treat many lives as effectively disposable. On a global scale, the predicament is even worse. Central to my secular humanism is a commitment to socioeconomic justice across the human species. Beyond declaring abstract rights, we should demand that the world's resources be shared so as to allow to all people the opportunity for a meaningful life. However thorough the dedication to egalitarian ideals, there will always be lives that do not go well, disrupted by contingencies beyond prediction or control. There will be no utopia in which all people enjoy the good life to which the aristocrats of the ancient world aspired. But we can try to decrease the frequency at which lives fall short. When they go awry, there should be efforts at rescue, support for the person's search for a new direction. If the efforts fail, that is a genuine loss, not to be glossed over with false promises of some future compensation. This is the only life the person has. We should be committed to salvage, not to salvation. Literalist religions often do better, far better than secular institutions in responding to the conditions that doom many people to lives marked by insecurity and confined to narrow horizons. But their efforts are compromised by supposing present failures to be redeemed in the hereafter, by affirming doctrines tainted by traditional prejudices, and by commitments to exclusivity that lead to interfaith conflict and perpetuation of the material and social miseries they endeavor to remedy. Religions that purify the pertinent elements, abandoning any literal commitment to immortality and the traditional divisive prejudices do even better Secular humanists should see them as allies, even as leaders in an ethically fundamental enterprise. Thinking of religions and religious communities as only directed toward the plight of the needy and oppressed misses an important dimension of the work they do. Connection to others is, I propose, central to the meaningful life, but I've emphasized the simplest form of connection, pairwise relations between individuals. Most meaningful lives exhibit a more complex structure of affiliations. Engaging with many others in joint projects and sharing common purposes is often central to people's life's themes. It's important to them to participate in common endeavors, that the endeavors proceed through mutual responsiveness, and that they themselves contribute to the eventual outcome. 
Today, most of us belong to societies in which the web of associations is not simply given, as it was for our Paleolithic ancestors or for the closely knit villages of the pre-industrial world. Contemporary people must seek community. Religious institutions are often the only places in which they find it. Communities of believers connect their members, providing a sense of belonging and of being together with others, of sharing problems and of working cooperatively to find solutions. Religious involvement doesn't merely provide occasions for talk about important issues, although that itself is valuable, but also for conjoint action. Sharing a religion, whether literalistic or purified, can foster agreement on goals, not necessarily focused on the liberation or socioeconomic progress of the faithful. Engaging in common pursuit of a good endorsed by fellow strivers and playing one's part is often the source of the deepest satisfactions. Where are similar satisfactions to be found? Particularly at some life stages in the narrower circle of the family, in nurturing children and caring for loved ones, in developing individual friendships, and especially in sustaining friends through times of adversity. Typically, the spaces in which rewarding interrelations are found are disjoint from the workplace, the sphere of most intense activity. Nurses and teachers, doctors and social workers can participate daily in joint efforts aimed at goals they and their co-workers endorse as important. Research scientists and statesmen may see themselves as working with others to improve the lot of millions. Yet the dominant condition of the workers of the modern world, even of the modern affluent world, is the one Marx diagnosed as alienated labor. The hours must be put in not to reach any end assessed as worthwhile by oneself or one's fellows, but simply so that something will be produced to make enough money to pay the wages and support the material basis of the workers' lives. Religion doesn't have to be the main vehicle of community life. Thoroughly secular societies can contain structures enabling people to enter into sympathetic relations with one another, to exchange views about topics that concern them most, to work together to identify goals that matter to all members of the group, and to pursue those ends through cooperative efforts. Authors of contemporary manifestos that call for freedom from religious delusions typically belong to professional communities with the important dimensions. The lack of similar secular structures for others disappears from their view. In many parts of the affluent world, however, particularly in the United States, there are no serious opportunities outside the synagogues and churches and mosques for fellowship with all the dimensions religious communities can provide. Even people who have little time for any substantive religious doctrine sometimes view the persistence of religion in the modern world as a welcome corrective to the dominance of crass materialism. Their diagnosis rests on an important insight, despite the usual talk of preserving the spiritual aspects of our nature. The core perception recognizes the conditions of modern life as distorting the autonomous choice and pursuit of one's own good, diverting people from more meaningful forms of existence they might have pursued and enjoyed. Satisfaction of the material needs of all, the preconditions of affording opportunities for meaningful lives, generates the quest for efficient production and the unsparing competition of the workplace. The secondary goal trickles down to individual lives, now seen in terms of competition for material goods and for the marks of status. Atomistic individuals attempt to play the role of homo economicus, not a role for which people are particularly well suited. Family life provides some refuge for meaningful projects, although these too may be misshapen by assumptions that the young must, above all, be equipped for the competition to come. Beyond the family projects lie only the goals of accumulating goods and prestige and of enjoying evanescent pleasures, goals the ancients already knew to be inadequate aspirations for a flourishing life. Religion is rightly seen as a corrective to the materialism of the age, not because it draws attention to any real spiritual realm, nor because of the correctness of any specific religious doctrine, no matter how minimal, but because of the importance to us of a multidimensional form of community life. For large swaths of contemporary affluent societies, religious communities are the principal places in which shared ethical life can be found. 
Secular humanism faces no intellectual problems in accounting for the potential meaningfulness of human existence. The real difficulties are practical, grounded in the need to overcome aspects of the contemporary world that unnecessarily limit the lives of many people. Resolving them is in part a matter of rethinking economic life and institutions, returning to a conception of political economy that frames its standards in the fundamental currency of values, not in the secondary goals of monetary profit. A central task is to devise secular substitutes for the multidimensional community life religions have bestowed on their followers. Attempts to solve that problem may seek inspiration in the successful strategies of the world's religions as the most prominent ventures in fashioning secular community, Unitarian churches, societies for ethical culture, and Jewish community centers have all done. If the initial results seem pallid imitations of the religious prototypes, lacking the powerful rites with their resonant words and uplifting music, it's worth recalling that the religions have had centuries of practice. Secular humanists should remember that experiments require time to make them work, and they should pursue the important practical goal with perseverance and patience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kitcher. I want to invite uh, questions, uh, if they could be directed by coming down the aisle to the front and using the microphones, that would be wonderful. Um, I'll just open with one. I, I, I love the, their, their line about um, that secular humanism has no ethical problems or intellectual problems. It's practical problems. And your entire talk, I, I was thinking a lot the whole time about Latter-day Saints, for whom the concept of celestial marriage was so central to initially bringing people into the religion, uh, you'd be married in perpetuity. Um, but one of the key elements of, of the religion, indeed, to this day, when you uh, see sociological studies of Mormons, mm. they speak about how it's not that I will be rewarded with being with these people for the rest of life in, a, in some ideal state. It's that I will get to continue the relational work that brings me such great spiritual pleasure in the next life with this person that the work continues in, in, in the world beyond. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I wanted to think uh, with you as you, you ended the talk, inviting us to think about uh, the formation of new kinds of secular institutions. And I guess I wanted uh, you to think aloud about when you, what you have in mind for those kinds of alternative spaces where multidimensional relational life can be fostered without an imperative of perpetuity. What do you, what do you when you think of that, what are the ones that, you, that come to mind for you? What are the spaces that come to mind? Uh, given that you did say at the end, this will take time, it's yeah. experimental, yeah. force nothing. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, as somebody who comes out of a religious childhood, I am struck whenever I go into the existing kinds of cultural spaces in which um, humanist groups or, unit or self styled Unitarian groups try to come together and, and um, sort of focus themselves on some sort of joint endeavor, some joint project, and try to construct ways in which this will be conveyed and made meaningful in their borrowings from the, from the if, for, if not the words, the structures of the religious rites. And it seems to me that one thing that, um, that is difficult really to convey here um, is the, the importance of what I call the kind of immortality that Thomas Mann allows you. The, the importance of the image of your life as having these reverberations that go on even though they cease. And I think actually overcoming that, that argument about the importance of an infinite sequence of activities is a crucial step in, in finding ways to structure this kind of joint focus on ethical activity so that it will work, as it were, more meaningfully. I don't know whether you've ever been to the Society for Ethical Culture or to, or to a, a Unitarian ceremony. I mean, it looks just, frankly, imitative. And when you see it as imitative, you see it automatically as giving up something that, um, that, that you know, richer religious um, conceptions can offer. And that's why it seems to me so important that this issue of our finitude be addressed 
as it were, at the center, to see ourselves as part of something that goes on without seeing ourselves as, something, as part of something that goes, goes on indefinitely. We need, in a sense, uh, a way of finding um, uh, um, ways to celebrate that. And so, so I think, actually, the, what I said in terms of the, of the solution to the intellectual problem is something that I would put at the very heart of the, the experimental process of designing these institutions. But I want to stick very much with what I said at, at the very end. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day, and the rites that are so powerful in various religions are, are you know, they are, they are the result of, you know, generations, it seems to me, of, of fine tuning. And it will take, I think, humanist culture a long time to work out the exact ways into which, in which to make this message of the importance to one another of relatedness and of knowing that that relatedness event eventually dissipates. That it, that it, that, and, and seeing that as, as something to be celebrated and understood and, and not to mourn the fact that, that, that there isn't the indefinite continuation. Thank you. My name is Tom Platt. I, I ha had some curiosity about your uh, reassurance to others dealing with their own mort mortality. Mm -hmm. For example, you, I don't know if Huxley had a chance to interact with this son who, who died. Let's say you had a grandchild who was fearful of uh, almost dying of a, of a terminal il illness and was fearful and d didn't share your intellectual maturity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to play that one by ear. But I mean, I wondered if you had any general thoughts of being put in this position of, of providing, say, reassurance to a small child who was fearful of dying. Well, I, mean, I have had children, so I've, I know what it's like when children suddenly discover that, that, that life doesn't go on forever. And of course, you, have, you, can't, you can't say to such children the kinds of things that I was saying today. That would be, that would be silly. But what you want, well, it would be silly and cruel. Um, what you want to say are the kinds of things that will help them grow into the kinds of beings who can one day, I hope, come to, um, come to see things from a perspective where they can, which is like Huxley's, where they can, they, they can, they can, look, at, they can look at death calmly and they can, they can feel its pain and they can, and they can still uh, resolve to continue the course on which they've set themselves. I find something admirable in what he, in what he did, um, in refusing uh, whatever consolation it was that, that Kingsley offered him. And of course, what he did um, was not only to devote himself to his remaining children, but also to devote himself to the projects, the intellectual projects that were central to his life. And I do think, I want to, to place emphasis on one thing that I said, that there is, um, perhaps for you, perhaps for me, we're not so young as we used to be. There is, I think, this invisible idea of the moment that comes in your life when you say, that's enough. I, could, it, if, I would like it to go on, but it doesn't have to go on any further. There's nothing that, uh, that remains, there's nothing crucial that remains unfinished about my life. That's why I drew attention to the, to, to the story of Simeon um, and in, in the New Testament. Um, but as far as what to say to children, I think, you know, I am not the right person to ask about that. You need to talk to somebody who's, who's expert on, uh, on child psychology. But as parents, you know, we tend to work these things out for ourselves. You probably did, and I did too. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Richard Prohm. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I wonder if you could refocus or, or gather together the comments you made about uh, autonomy and its role in, 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 in uh, the production of meaning, because it appeared in lots of places, but yep. not as essential. Right. Okay, so I follow, I feel, follow Mill and Humboldt and Kant here, right? I, I think it's very important uh, for a meaningful and worthwhile life that it be your life 
That is something you choose, something you identify with. So I think that the preconditions for a meaningful life are that you don't get coerced into, uh, even subtly coerced, into taking on some particular role that your society thinks is the fitting one for you to, uh, to play. Uh, and that you have, as it were, the opportunity to explore and to understand a large range of options. This is all sort of standard, I think, standard mill. Um, uh, now, as I think about the, what one might think of as the religious answer to this, where your, your life is seen as in relation to something, to some sort of cosmic project, that seems to me a kind, it, a kind of, um, rather grand version of the familiar practice in many human societies of assigning roles at birth based, say, on um, status in the society or the, or the caste or whatever. Um, it seems to me the same kind of alienating coerci coercive suppression of autonomy, which is why I talked about it in the religious context as, I mean, I, I, from my secular perspective, the religious solution just is a non-solution because I think Kant and Humboldt and Mill were actually right about this condition of autonomy. So even if you think about yourself as contributing to some, um, to some cosmic project, and of course it's an ironic twist of the finitude argument that if you're contributing to that project, your contribution can only be infinitesimal. That's why I chose that word rather deliberately. Um, you, on my account of, of, of how religion works at its best, the most that can be made of that is you, you make this, this infinitesimal contribution to something I know not what. And that strikes me as, as really at odds with uh, a precondition for the worthwhile life, which is why I said um, in perhaps this rather over-assertive and not very friendly fashion that humanism, humanism can only be secular. Hi, my name is Ike Swetlitz, um, and I have a question um, about the possibility of the continuity of non-religious communities to the same extent that religious communities have been continuous. Because it seems like even if you admit that human life is finite, the fact that there is an infinite transcendence associated with the religion um, is, in a large part, some of the reasons why the most enduring communities that have existed throughout history uh, are, are, are based on religion and not based on nationality and not based on culture mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and even the less um, uh, orthodox streams of religion that have given cultural enterprises like the JCCs you mentioned yeah. have still acknowledged a commitment to that, to the, to the infinite divine being that extends infinitely into the past and infinitely into the future. And, and I'm wondering how you, can, how you can guarantee the continuity of a community that doesn't in some part believe in something transcendently, infinitely larger than itself? Okay, that's a terrific question. Um, and it brings me back actually to the first question that was posed because it seems to me that this does require a reorientation. Um, I think one, um, you, th you think of community as founded on, uh, as religious community as founded on something that in, endures indefinitely and is always there and is always larger than me. And I want to replace that with the idea of community as larger than the individual, larger than even than the social um, group that is brought together in, in, in this community, but not but not permanent. And I think th that's, why I, that's why I put at the center of my lecture this, this story of, of this, of this, this, this piece from Thomas Mann's novel, because I think it's very important to make this conceptual shift from the infinitely greater and enduring with which I connect myself to the something larger than me, that, and to see that as being, as it were, uh, central to the formation of community. Now, you, guarantees are not to be had here. I, I, I don't believe in guarantees, and I don't even believe in guarantees for your religious communities. But um, the, the point is, 
and this is in the spirit of what I said in the last sector about the ethical project, the, the commitment to an evolving project which may change its forms. So um, one shouldn't be, I think, um, uh, taken aback in one's commitment to a community that endures but probably won't endure forever by the thought that that may need to be reconstituted in the future that that's all part of the human project. And that also has to be woven in. Um, now, of course, it's a very, uh, you know, if you say there is this one thing and we are, going to be, we are going to be connected with that forever, you have a particular virtue. You have the virtue of, in a certain sense, sustaining things. But the corresponding vice is that there may be moments when these communities and societies need reorganization when for the as it were for the development of of the of the value of human lives it would actually be better that they were reorganized and I think that um, so I think that, uh, that, that the apparent gain in stability is offset perhaps by um, uh, a threat of rigidity so um, that's a, a complicated answer to your question. It's a very good question, but I do think it reminds me of what I wanted to say to, the, to Catherine's first question, which is really that the, the, at the center of all of this is the idea of the connection between me and something much larger than myself, but not infinite. of the new pope kissing the feet of a woman whom he visited in a hospital. Yeah. And it occurs to me that one of the things that religion does easily, that its secular relation replacement has difficult doing, is a kind of scaffolded humility. Mm -hmm. A way of allowing a kind of non-self-righteous altruism to be a central thread of one's life. And I wonder whether you have thoughts that strikes me as a problem almost as difficult as the one of the connection to the eternal mm -hmm. or a secular analog of religion to solve. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I mean I'm very much in sympathy with that because my last lecture my the lecture before this one puts at the center of the ethical project the idea of techniques for developing our responsiveness to others. And it seems to me that that is, that that is a crucial feature of ethical advance. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So this is, but this seems to me not an intellectual problem again, but a, but a practical problem. It's a practical problem about the structures in which this kind of, of, of expansion of ourselves to bring, come into relationship with others can really flourish. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. And perhaps I should have made, uh, perhaps I should see this. I have to think about it. As, as a problem as deep as, or a deep aspect of the problems that, uh, about community that I was struggling to articulate at the end. I mean, I think the problems I was looking at are the problems of people being able to find spaces in which they can engage in these, uh, these joint projects and set up these structures. What, you, what you're suggesting is that there's, there's something else that the church does very well, which is providing a structure within which others' altruism can be ex accepted and thereby encouraging um, you know, the fuller development of that. That seems to me a very interesting insight, actually. Good, thank you. Sorry for that. Um, you spoke a little bit about the recluse who sits and watches blades of grass. Counts. Uh, counts them, yeah. It's a classic philosophical example, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more of, about your thoughts of a conception of a meaningful life that focuses on um, experiencing and absorbing sort of the beauty of the world as opposed to contributing to it or 
place yeah. where it goes into. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, perhaps this is a prejudice on my part, but I'm going to be I'm going to dig in my heels about it. I think I think if you are um, on your own, no matter how much you contemplate, no matter how much poetry goes through Keats keeps his teeming brain, if he doesn't write it down then that's not a meaningful life. Uh, I, it's a, this, is, this is, if you like, a development of the anti-hedonism which runs through the, 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 good life, uh, um, the good life literature. I mean, there's a famous, uh, you're too young to have seen the movie Sleeper, probably, old Woody Allen Sleeper. There, there's a you know, moment in which you know, he, he discovers this, this machine into which you can go and you can just have pleasure beyond, right? It's called the orgasmatron, right? And, and, and he goes inside and it rocks like this. <laughs> and uh, I mean, look, the ancients saw that, uh, that the orgasmatron was not, uh, not the solution to the problem of the good life. Um, and I think that one's own um, contemplation of the universe, one's own um, uh, act of private creation is still not enough. It has to be, um, it has to reach out and touch others. This is, this is in a certain sense, um, part of this general theme of questions that is coming up. I mean, people are saying, okay, so how do you, how do you make substitutes in various ways for this relationship to something which is permanent or enduring? That's the, uh, that's the source of this extremely good question that came from here. And the answer seems to me to, to be to substitute um, for the idea of something that for all times exures, endures to which you're connected, um, the idea of your being connected to something that endures at times when you're not, when no longer present, making a difference to others. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really committed to that. Lives matter when they touch others' line. So solitaries, solitaries don't make it, even if they don't count blades of grass and devote themselves to, you know high-minded thinking about the beauties of nature. I think it's a um, lovely point to end on, I'm not slipping into the solipsism of the secular. Instead, joining us is a question next door. Uh, to continue all these questions, we're saying, Mr. Richardson, the last lecture is this Thursday. Yeah, uh, depravity on Thursday. <laughs> sure about the meanings of words in their worlds, scientific, ethical, literary. But by the end, you feel certain that you are also quite formally confused and now have been righted by somebody who carries every tool in his toolbox. There may be and are, I think, many words for this kind of graceful thinker, but for the purposes of our contemporary humanist moment, I want to celebrate Philip Kitcher, and most particularly as an interdisciplinary artist as somebody for whom the questions of our time simply cannot be conceived merely through transom windows. We need kaleidoscope eyes to parry with the problems of self, body, science, history, philanthropy, and community. Our disciplines discipline us absolutely, but like all martial disciplines, they cannot be useful if we can only follow their paces in regulated forms at the beginning of classes. At the same time that I was discovering Kitcher in the LRB, a group of Frenchmen calling themselves the Yamakasi Group developed parkour, a kind of street gymnastics in which highly trained individuals move quickly through urban environments using complex material facts of the city as their leverage and inspiration. YouTube that later, parkour. Today, we will hear Professor Kitcher's third lecture in the Terry series titled Mortality and Meaning. And we will get to watch what I think of as parkour and rhetorical form, as Professor Kitcher uses concepts from the world to make sense of it with incomparable agility and careful grace. Please help me welcome Professor Kitcher again to Yale University. Thank you, that was really lovely. We'll talk over dinner. <laughs> Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. This is Darwin at a funeral. Mortality and meaning raise connected challenges to secular humanism. 
I'm going to try to show that many of the difficulties are more apparent than real. How should a secular humanist think about the prospect of his own death? A classic recommendation sees fear as inappropriate. With death will come the end of pain, of suffering, of frustrated striving. Hamlet, meditating suicide, calls death a consummation devoutly to be wished, until, turning suddenly devout, he imagines an afterlife in which the torments of mundane existence continue. Secularists who dismiss that possibility can avoid Hamlet's anxious retreat. Being dead is nothing to be frightened of. But there's the getting there. Fear can be directed not toward the state itself, but at the process of dying. People are often afraid not only of the pains that come at the end, but also of the unraveling of body and mind. So they're terrified at the thought of what they are likely to become, foreseeing the surviving being as a grotesque parody of themselves. These concerns deserve support from those who might help them avoid, or at least mitigate, the conditions they fear. Support need not and probably should not come from religion, but from humane deployment of medical resources. Careful thoughts about the end should be expressed, developed in end-of-life conversations designed to allow death to approximate a person's reflective image of her life. Secular humanists regret that religious affiliations and indeed religious interventions all too often override people's anxieties about the inevitable ending. Yet maybe I've focused on the wrong emotion. As you look forward to the future, in 1868, two years after he'd finished the six movements originally planned for his German Requiem, Brahms inserted a seventh, a soprano solo, punctuated by muted interjections from the chorus. You just heard that, uh, at least in the background. The text he chose promises consolation. Those who grieve will be comforted. The bereaved will again see those they have lost. Brahms' setting responds to the mourner's sorrow with gestures of exquisite tenderness. Music-loving secularists, however resolute their non-belief, should concede its emotional power. Culturally successful religions are often credited with enabling their followers to understand and to accept the major transitions in human life. They've had plenty of practice, typically centuries or millennia in which they've shaped their rights. Those like Christianity and Islam that promise an eternal continuation to which mundane human life is a prelude seem specially adept at coping with the last transition. Death is supposedly easier for the devout to bear. Part of the relief comes from prospects of personal continuation and hopes for reunion with others who have been loved and lost. Consolation also flows from faith in a link between human individuals and the transcendent, a connection that confers upon each human life an eternal significance. For the non-believer, however, there's no hope of future survival or of reclaiming the dead. Individual human lives are thoroughly finite, their effects evanescent. All human life will eventually cease. Human finitude leaves nothing to celebrate in the wake of a human life. What you about this one. This is, you teach a course on death. Yeah. Good evening or afternoon, lovely afternoon. Welcome. First, I want to remind everyone uh, just to maintain the loveliness of our opening audiology. If you could turn off your cell phones, that would be a great way to begin this ritual event. My name is Catherine Lofton, and I teach uh, in the history of religions here at Yale University. I want to welcome you to this, the third lecture in a four-lecture series of this year's Dwight H. Terry Lectureship. This year's Terry Lectures are being given by Philip Kitcher, currently teaching at Columbia University in their Department of Philosophy, where he holds an appointment as the John Dewey Professor of Philosophy, an auspicious title which 
In the opening lecture, Dale Martin pointed out that Dewey himself was the first person to give the lectures in this series. Since Professor Kitcher has already been introduced twice in this series with preambles that beautifully emphasized his enormous list of accomplishments, academic appointments, notable awards, significant editorial stewardships, and intellectual contributions, I'm going to defer for now those proper noun-laden remarks, trust that all of you possess Google in your disposal, and can quickly stand in the very true awe at the totems of Professor Kitcher's remarkable career of institutional <laughs> service and philosophical significance. Instead, I want to offer a very brief homage to the kind of intellectual that Professor Kitcher is. I first encountered Professor Kitcher in the, it may seem strange, I'm a scholar of American religious history, why do I stand here today? And the reason is that I revealed to Professor Dale Martin the following strange biographical fact. That in the late 1990s, I, as then a late adolescent, was a typical, I think of perhaps people in this room, a late adolescent nerd gobbling up very popular nerd publications like the London Review of Books. I would receive the LRB and the NYRB in bundles from a family for which I was an occasional au pair. And I would sit for very long heathen Sundays, gorging on their contents. During the same time period, Hitcher had an occasional appearance in the LRB, offering diagnosis on a subject that was at the time very close to my late adolescent heart, the question of evolution, biology, and concepts of the self. In those essays, Kitcher, already an established academic philosopher, although I hardly knew that at the time, spoke to the absolute nub of every problem he found, quickly cutting away the illogic of this or that scientific shibboleth with a knowledge that seemed to my young eye as the very definition of the total intellectual. He was wry, sure, and he had a kind of rhetorical panache. But more importantly to me, he seemed so clear-eyed before the grandiose world and its confusion of obnoxious interpretations. A review of Kitcher's writing, which this occasion has offered me the opportunity to peruse, shows that time and again, he walks into material, into knotty thickets, and carefully straightens out their cords, chatting amiably to you, the reader, above this nonsense as he does so. You begin any Kitcher book or article feeling very